All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Angela Mwachi Willick, Dean of Boston University School of Law, and I want to welcome you to the 19th annual Pike Lecture on Health Law. The Pike Lecture is held each year to honor Neil Pike, a graduate of BU Law from the class of 1937. Mr. Pike was a distinguished attorney who practiced law for 45 years. He was an avid supporter of BU Law and a tireless advocate for individuals with disabilities. As a child, Mr. Pike suffered a devastating illness that resulted in blindness. He was educated at Perkins School for the Blind, where he earned straight A's before entering BU Law in 1934. Upon graduation, he took the bar examination and placed in the top 20 out of 600 candidates. And ultimately, Mr. Pike also became the first blind person to be admitted to the bar of the United States Supreme Court. So we welcome you today in his honor. Our speaker today is Stanford Professor of Law and Justin M. Roach, Jr.'s faculty scholar, Rabia Belt. Professor Belt is a legal historian whose work focuses on disability and citizenship. Her scholarship ranges from cultural analysis of disability in the media to contemporary issues facing voters with, dis with disability and the historical treatment of disabled Americans. Professor Belt also is a trailblazer and a history maker. She is the first tenured black woman professor at Stanford Law School. Professor Belt is currently writing a book entitled Disabling Democracy in America, Mental Incompetence, Citizenship, Suffrage, and the Law from 1819 to 1920. And the book is forthcoming in the Studies in Legal History series with Cambridge University Press. Professor Belt is also a highly recognized and awarded professor. In 2015, the American Society of Legal History named her a Catherine T. Pryor Scholar for her paper, Bullet, Ballots for Bullets, The Disenfranchisement of Civil War Veterans. And because of her vocal and prominent advocacy for people with disabilities, in 2016, President Barack Obama named Professor Belt to the National Council on Disability, the independent federal agency that advises the president Congress and other federal agencies regarding policies and practices that affect people with disabilities. Additionally, Professor Belt served as a member of the Board of Directors for the Disability Rights Bar Association. Now, there's obviously a lot more I could say about Professor Belt's prolific body of work, but I know that you all are eager to hear from her, so please join me in welcoming Professor Rabia Belt to the podium. Thank you. This is very fitting, too, for all the Halloween candy <laughs> when I get back. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Thank you to Dean and Watching Willing, who is someone who has been so kind and lovely to me ever since I was a law student at Michigan. Go Blue. And thank you to Laura Stevens, Nicole Huberfeld, Elizabeth Cheney. Um, for doing all of the work and invitation to bring me here. And also thank you to Mr. Neil Pike, who as a distinguished blind lawyer and BU graduate, reminds us of the long history of disability in the United States and the importance of highlighting disability when it may be forgotten or overlooked. So this talk is derived from the forthcoming book that Dean and Watching Willing um, just mentioned. And this book examines how ideas about mental disability and mental capacity shapes the development of voting rights over the long 19th century, from 1819, when Maine becomes the first state to disenfranchise people based on mental status, to 1920, when women were granted the right to vote. And, well, when the 19th Amendment eliminates discrimination and voting on the basis of sex. The book is divided into two parts. The first part discusses the buildup of the legal regime that disenfranchises people based on mental status. The second part looks at this legal contestation that occurs once this regime is put into place. And the chapters are roughly chronological, but the chapters are thematic. And for this first part, I discuss the state actors legislators, state constitutional convention delegates that disenfranchise people based on their mental status. 
And perhaps folks, bless you, are more familiar with the expansion story of democracy in the first part of the 1800s. Um, or I've heard of a term of something like Jacksonian democracy, um, which has been used to describe the removal of explicit economic requirements for voting, um, such as property owning or tax paying. I think what is presumably less familiar are the details of what happened as these economic requirements for voting were written out of the law. New restrictions, including bans on people voting based on their minds, uh, were put into place in nearly every state, roughly starting in the Northeast as states wrote new constitutions after the American Revolution, westward as states, new states entered the Union, and then later in the South, both before and after the Civil War, um, especially um, in the wake of revising their constitutions during Reconstruction, they wrote in these uh, new voting restrictions based on mental status. And this category included people under guardianship, people adjunct non compos mentis, lunatics, insane people, idiots, and residents of charitable institutions. Also, in the early days of the 1800s, mental disability shifted from divine affliction to a medical diagnosis. Um, reformers and alienists who were precursors to psychiatrists drawing from European innovations discovered insane and idiotic people as a social problem and a medical disorder that professionals in charge of new institutions such as lunatic asylums could solve. So this is a picture um, painting by Robert Fleury in 1795 of Philippe Pinel, who um, was releasing a patient um, from her chains at the Salpetriere in France and his treatise on insanity, which was translated into English in 1806, was really foundational in moving towards institutionalized care um, for folks with mental disabilities instead of confining them um, in places such as the house, the prison, stuff like that. Also, metaphor alert here in terms of what's going on. So this is treated as a positive story. There's some shadows there. Um, the second part of this book, um, which looks at congressional investigations into contested elections and judges deciding between squabbling election losers and winners quickly unravels the confident consensus assumed by the formal law in the first part. So when folks uh, wrote the statutes and constitutional clauses that disenfranchise people based on mental status, state legislators and constitutional convention delegates confidently thought that it was obvious who they were referring to. And everyone would know who was an insane person or an idiotic person when they saw them. Um, thus, they did not include any procedures for determining <laughs> lunacy or idiocy with respect to voting and the law itself. And the chapters in the second part examine the consequences of that lack of detail. Um, and then the fallback on reputation, race, age, and other metrics to determine mental competence. Pulling the lens out a bit from the state allows me to think of mental disability not just as a status that is held by a discrete group of people, but also as a category of analysis that situates people in different positions and has different implications depending on context. Also permits me to explore how the battle over the vote was not just a legal contest, but it was also a cultural one. I think that suffrage activists, for example, played an important part in the cultural work that increasingly made it a given that mental fitness was a prerequisite for political citizenship. I also think that attacks on the mental capacity of black Americans during this time is a crucial terrain to explore. I didn't want to limit the account of the first part of this book to the elite white men who had the clout to inscribe their beliefs into the formal law. I also wanted to look at the people who were pushing the, the state to make changes on their behalf because they were being 
excluded. And part of the struggle for these activists who pushed for enfranchisement was that they had to challenge the widespread conclusion that people were mentally incompetent based on race or sex and or sex um, as compared to most white men and that mental incompetence disqualified them for the franchise. Um, I do talk more about white women suffrage activists in another chapter, I'm happy to talk about it during the Q&A here. And incorporating the voices of multiple actors with conflicting agendas in the first part creates a web of definitions for terms such as lunacy or idiocy that rub against the neat labels that are written into state constitutions and statutes. So as a result, this is a book that looks at law from the top, the middle, bottom. It charts both law in the books, law in practice, and the tangled network of meanings created by many types of Americans as they grappled with what democracy, citizenship, and the vote meant to them. So what's happening in this chapter in particular? Insanity is killing off the Negro race, the New York Times said in 1903. White observers such as Joseph Camp Kennedy, the superintendent of the 1860 census, concluded based on census statistics purportedly showing black decline that the extinction of African Americans was an unerring certainty. In speeches, articles, and conferences, doctors bore witness to what they thought was a new phenomenon. Dr. J.F. Miller, the superintendent of the Eastern Hospital in North Carolina, told the Tri-State Medical Association in 1900, quote, we have on our hospital rolls 452 crazy Negroes, end quote. This was a new situation for him as, quote, many intelligent laymen of observation have informed me that they never knew a crazy Negro before, prior to emancipation, end quote. While there were some black people who were eloquent orators, Miller opined, quote, I do not think I am unjust to say that the vast majority of the Negro race have little capacity, end quote. Miller's colleague, Thomas Mays, a professor at the Rush Hospital for Consumption in Philadelphia, made much the same argument in his brochure, increase of insanity and consumption among the Negro population of the South since the war, Civil War. Like Miller, Mays cited the insanity statistics of the census to make its point that free black people were mentally overwhelmed by the demands of civilization. In Mississippi in 1888, an observer remarked, insanity among slaves was scarcely known, while now, since they have become free, it has become alarmingly common. C.B. Denton, who served on the North Carolina Board of Public Charities, observed that since the Civil War, North Carolina was obligated to build a colored insane asylum that failed to capacity twice, requiring renovations, and was overflowing yet again. He remarked, in our antebellum days, the spectacle of a hysterical insane Negro was very rare. In 1892, the superintendent of the State Lunatic Asylum in Missouri, Dr. LeGrand Atwood, stated, prior to the war between the states, a crazed Negro was the rarest bird on earth. At present, the asylums of the South team with them. So what was causing all of these occurrences? According to these observers, the phenomena they were witnessing was due to a foundational mental weakness inherent in black people. Indeed, in, the, in 1846 um, article in the leading alienist publication, the American Journal of Insanity, they reported a link between civilization's advancements and insanity. Um, and this connection was supposed to explain why there were so few insane Africans. Unlike American society, African societies were less civilized and complex and thus less likely to produce insanity. As proof, the article noted that Cinque and the other members of the famous Amistad uprising had visited the retreat for the insane in Hartford, Connecticut, and saw many of the patients there, and they informed the writer of this article, quote, that insanity was very rare in their native country. These observers and researchers argued that slavery only managed to mask the effects of this fundamental mental incapacity because enslavers were in charge 
of enslaved people's lives. Enslaved people were buffered from the shocks of full citizenship. And then now that slavery was over with the Civil War, black people were doomed. And these assumptions rested on the science of the day. All the specifics changed throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries and later. Purported black mental inferiority compared to white people was a constant. Theoretical frameworks such as polygenesis, which held that races emerged from distinct origins, worked alongside disciplines such as craniology and physiognomy to help entrench ideas about black, black mental inferiority in the scientific imagination. And these medical assertions did not just fill the pages of medical treatises and articles. They were, and they were not particularly uh, purely about psychiatric diagnosis and cure. And speculation about black mental incompetency and potential also shaped black political opportunities before and after slavery. So in particular, these observers argued that black people were exceptionally unfit for political citizenship and the vote. They were concerned that um, the franchise, bless you, needed to be guarded from them because if they were uh, thrust into um, voting, then they would be mentally weak sheep, easily led to the polls by corrupt Republican political leaders. The parties were switched back then. Um, and put in charge of the political process themselves quickly make a mess of it. Um, and also, before going further, hopefully folks have been pretty disturbed by a lot, some of the language I've been using so far. OK, so good. Um, I will. <laughs> there's something that's part really difficult in talking about terrible things done to people. Terrible words are used to describe them. And when it comes to quotations, um, I'm quoting the words of my historical actors that said, though, I'm not a big fan of saying these words either myself. So um, in terms of the te terminology here, um, lunacy or insanity roughly corresponds to what we would talk about these days with respect to psychiatric or mental impairments. And idiocy or feeble-mindedness roughly corresponds to what we would talk about today with intellectual or developmental impairments. OK, I just want to flag here in terms of this language being odious and awful. Um, so when it came to um, these ideas of purported black mental inferiority, black activists challenged these assumptions in multiple ways. They contested the idea that black the mental incompetence was racially determined. They displayed evidence of black acumen and potential. And they pointed to white voters, particularly the Irish, who they claimed did not fulfill the electoral mandate of mental incompetency, mental competency themselves. And community activities, such as military service here as a man in the 54th Massachusetts Infantry, which I assume guys know about here, um, and um, also literary societies um, before and after the Civil War were important in demonstrating to a white public um, black mental acumen. There are also uh, direct political activism and rhetoric, such as speeches, sermons, petitions, and a color convention movement, um, which was a series of gatherings across the country for black people to meet, discuss politics, and generate petitions and campaigns to challenge racial subordination. And black advocates worked in different registers. Some, like Frederick Douglass, challenged the mental inferiority of black people specifically, arguing that any cognitive difficulties facing individual black people could be ascribed to a lack of education. Others questioned the idea of mental inferiority in general. And while they dis differed in their interpretation of black performance, they shared an investment in black education and the claim that black people should not be disenfranchised as a race because of some general idea of mental acumen. However, mental competence for voting was a very useful tool for white supremacists who are intent on reducing or eliminating black suffrage because the term was so malleable. Um, it could be shrunk, applied, stretched to a number of different types of people and behaviors. And in particular in this chapter, I talk about 
claims of black and mental incompetency to vote developing among, along two main lines, um, insanity and ignorance. Insanity was a medical term carried over into the socio-political realm. Um, and not all black people were described as insane, um, but they were described as a warning indicator of general black mental weakness. Um, more commonly, accusations of ignorance were deployed to indict most black people. And this isn't a medical term. Um, and when using the term ignorance, white supremacists meant that black people were poorly educated in their present state and the forecast for future mental improvement was dim. And ignorance also consolidated people along the axis of race, while poor white people could also be ignorant um, under their formulation in contrast to black people. Um, they could escape this category through education. Unlike insanity or idiocy, ignorance was not written into voting laws and regulations as a disenfranchising status on its own. Instead, it was used as a broader indictment of potential black voters as a whole, as an amorphous label of black mental acumen and a justification for increasing voting pr procedures to restrict black voting. Both before and after the Civil War, white supremacists used these claims of black mental inferiority as an attack on black voting. And it was a tool to police the composition of the voting population because it purported to guard the integrity of the vote by allowing only those competent and responsible enough to wield the vote to have it. And in the antebellum era before the Civil War, white supremacist pop pop politicians use purported black mental incompetence to argue for disenfranchising black people in northern states and justifying slavery for the south. So the most notorious um, pre-Civil War controversy was uh, related to the 1840 census. So that was when the US census started tracking um, this based on race, region, and country of origin. and the, initial 1840 census results aligned with these stereotypes uh, that free black people were susceptible to insanity. And according to the results, northern black people were 10 times more likely to be insane than southern black people, um, even though the ratio of insanity in white southerners and white northerners was essentially the same. So these census results gave a scientific veneer to these racist stereotypes um, that were already present. And abolitionist um, James McCune Smith, who was the first black American to obtain a men medical degree, dismantled these statistics used in the census in a series of articles in the New York Tribune and re reprinted in the Liberator and the National Anti-Slavery Anti Standard. But freedom has not made us mad, McKeon said. It has strengthened our minds by throwing us upon our own resources and has bound us to American institutions with a tenacity which nothing but death can overcome. And even though people like McKeon quickly refuted these statistics, they got caught up in a broader um, debate about slavery and black mental potential. Um, and even though there was um, a petition submitted by John Quincy Adams in the House of Representatives, it's really to no avail in terms of the lingering after effects of the 1840 census. I would say, though, that even though the 1840 census was the most controversial, both for contemporaries and scholars, doctors and politicians continue to use census statistics to argue for black decline and against black enfranchisement, such as the example I quoted earlier about the 1860 census director. Here, um, pro-slavery de delegates to the 1864 Maryland Constitutional Convention used the 1860 US census to argue that free black people had higher rates of criminality and insanity, and they compiled this table as evidence for record for it. After slavery ended and 
Racial discrimination in voting was ostensibly prohibited in the US Constitution in the 14th and then the 15th Amendments, and black people were able to vote and be elected to office, mental incompetence still proved to be useful. Um, perhaps it was even more useful at that point to justify dis disenfranchisement and racial subordination um, because it was race neutral as a cover story. To um, have race-based exclusion that passed muster under the Reconstruction Amendments and the 15th Amendment. Um, white Americans invested in white political supremacy, contended that mental competency was required to vote, and that ignorant black voters caused corrupted elections. Uh, thus, um, increased procedural voting regulations were necessary to purge the election process of these corrupt practices and ignorant voters. And in practice, mental incompetence's descriptive flexibility allowed white elites to control the electoral metrics that would deny would-be black voters the franchise while permitting other white men to vote. So there's an abundant other books, um, which I encourage you to read, about the fight for black voting rights and also about racism and science. The goal for my chapter in this presentation is different. It's really to highlight a collateral consequence of this fight for black suffrage. The cementing of the link between black competence, I mean, sorry, mental competence and political citizenship. Um, its implication, which some historians of black history may overlook, um, and also voting history, has significant consequences for these people deemed too mentally incompetent to pass muster as full political citizens. And it allows me to tell a complicated intersectional story. So mental competence was an intersectional project defined along the axis of mental disability and race. Individual white men um, whose mental status was suspect had an ability to challenge this designation. They could um, have their day in court. There could be a hearing in the halls of Congress. But any individuals who was black, even Frederick Douglass, um, did not have that chance. Um, black people were disenfranchised as a group. Um, and the key component for assessing their mental fitness for political citizenship really boiled down to race. There was also an issue of triangulation happening here. So white supremacists pointed to black mental inferiority, but they also policed white men who were considered inferior and threatening to um, white supremacy, especially in the future, and in particular, the Irish. And black folks also pointed to white people they thought didn't pass muster either, which also happened to be Irish. And it led to characters such as this. So this was a political cartoon, which is titled The Ignorant Vote. And it is apparently the um, challenges that both the South and the North faced with respect to voting. So it is a caricature of a black man from the South looking at a caricature of a Irish man from the North. Um, and these were both, whoop, sorry, the challenges of the people, the grotesque stereotype people that are not properly political citizens. So we know this, but I just want to reinforce here that all politics and all social movements have choices that have costs and benefits, okay? Um, this isn't a story of clipping the wings of the vanguards of the black freedom struggle. Um, it's supposed to be one that gives us another angle, an example of how hard the struggle was. Um, and some of the other people that may have been swept up in their wake. Um, I'm gonna end a bit here to look at these two different speeches with Frederick Douglass as examples. So the first one, is from a speech he gave in 1863, present and future of the colored race in America. I should like to know what constitutes inferiority and the standard of superiority 
must a man be as wise as Socrates, as learned as Humboldt, as profound as Bacon, or as eloquent as Charles Sumner, before it could be reckoned among superior men? Alas, if this were so, few even of the most cultivated of the white race could stand the test. This speech challenges the idea of mental competence in voting, questions what is the threshold for a mental, mentally competent voter, and punctures the idea that all white male voters would truly qualify. Here's the second, 1865. What the black man wants is speech in Massachusetts, here in Boston, the Anti-Slavery Society. It is said we are ignorant, I admit it. But if we know enough to be hung, we know enough to vote. If the Negro knows enough to pay taxes to support the government, he knows enough to vote. Taxation and representation should go together. If he knows enough to shoulder a musket and to fight for the flag, bless you, fight for the government, he knows enough to vote. If he knows as much as when he is sober as an Irishman knows when he is drunk, he knows enough to vote on good American principles. So here, he is addressing head on these stereotypes uh, characterized in ignorance of black mental inferiority. He uses another stereotype of the time in terms of linking Irish folks to alcoholism and poor character. But the speech also illustrates the many contours and stakes of voting. Notes that black people perform the duties of citizenship like tax paying and military service without receiving the rights and privileges or protections. He speaks of the performance of competent citizenship with military service, but also pointedly says if he knows enough to, hung, to be hung, he knows enough to vote, suggesting that this type of competent performance should not be necessary to receive the protector and of the American polity. And he lays bare the stakes of this political citizenship debate that black people are under siege by underscoring the hypocrisy of applying competency as a test for rights but not responsibilities. Douglas implies that in the end, the debate over the mental state of black voters was driven by racial animus. Douglas and other black activists faced numerous obstacles in redefining the, the meaning of mental competency and its relationship to black citizenship. Arguing for enfranchisement as a protective measure, for example, clashed with the idea that vulnerable categories of people such as women, children, and mentally disabled men could be represented politically by independent white men without being enfranchised themselves. Redefining mental competency so that it was not just defined in racially saturated medical research and literacy performances and could include expertise derived from enslaved labor practices and culture or black prowess abroad was also a challenge. Further, discussing the psychological wounds of enslavement and racial subordination in public brought political risk and consequences for freed people by potentially presenting themselves as damaged or injured um, to white viewers and justifiably disenfranchisable citizens. Um, to talk then about the psychological trauma of enslavement had strong political consequences. So did talk of economic, educational disadvantage they had to challenge stereotypes of racially based mental instability and to challenge the stereotype, challenge white supremacy, emphasize the traumatic and educational consequences of subordination, violence, slavery, second class citizenship, a lack of socioeconomic resources. These were all hard needles to thread. Certainly advocates and others did so. They tried to thread this needle but not everyone, both then and now, could hold all these threads in view simultaneously. And I probably just mixed my metaphors here, sorry, but hopefully you get my point. And here are some of these efforts in trying to do so. So this is something which is a marker of the Central Lunatic Asylum, which was the first asylum that was uh, open to black people. So in W.B. Du Bois's magisterial Black Reconstruction in America, which I highly urge everyone to read, it's really, um, was a leader in overturning sort of racist ideas about reconstruction. He has a chapter in which he describes the many things that black people did when they were able to be um, uh, elected officials in charge of Southern governments, things like that. And he has one sentence, 
on, um, and they opened a lunatic asylum for black people. No citation. It's like WV Du Bois, help a girl out here. But then <laughs> there were efforts to try to get care for um, mentally disabled black people. There were also people like Sojourner Truth who was turned away when she tried to vote who highlighted her strength and fortitude and intelligence in her work as an enslaved person in her speeches, which she delivered without notes, unlike me, um, because she was functionally illiterate. She had to memorize them. So in conclusion, so consequently, although white supremacists, white elites, and black activists battled, sometimes to the death, over whether black people were mentally incompetent, both sides generally conceded the linkage between mental competency and voting. This flexibility of mental competency served the interest of white supremacy um, and elites who sought to maintain discretionary authority over the makeup of the political constituency in the United States. And they can do so in part by repurposing these arguments about people's minds. Black activists challenge these ideas of black mental incompetence that should disenfranchise them, but largely left intact the idea that mental incompetence should disenfranchise some people um, and that it mattered to the vote. As a result, both people within the state and outside of the state expanded and reinforced the expectations and prerequisite of mental competency for the vote. So thank you. Hi, Robbie, this is terrific as always. Thank your, you. your work is outstanding. Um, I, I guess I have two questions. One is, um, I think you alluded to this, but if you could connect the, connect, um, the line between those who get labeled insane and those who are in, in some mode of protest or, di or being a dissident. Um, I'm think, uh, my, a friend of mine, Jeremy Eichler, just wrote a book called Time's Echo, and one of his characters, Arthur Schoenberg, um, is a composer, and he starts to sound paranoid in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s, but he was crazy like a fox. And so I wonder if one story here is about, um, and also I think William Lloyd Garrison is often called crazy, Frederick Douglass. So those who are engaged in protest, the way to marginalize is, is to um, call them insane. If you, uh, so that's one question. The other question is just, um, to, if you can go back to the slide where you had the, the rise of, uh, very early, I think it was your first, your very first slide um, about the rise of these uh, restrictions on voting. Um, it, and so it's, it's yeah, that's exa exactly. And so it's interesting that there's such a, a run from the 19, 1820s, 30s, 40s. Um, this is an era where black voting is already, free black voting is already being restricted on the basis of race anyway. Could you put this in context of class as well, right? So this is the, the rise of, um, uh, of uh, the, the fall of property qualifications happens in the early 19th century. This is, it seems like this is one way to cut back on poor people voting. Mm -hmm. And then in the, at once you have the 14th and 15th Amendment, then you have the rise of literacy tests and poll taxes and felony disenfranchisement. I, I just, I, I know that puts a lot on the table, but I wonder if you could just put this move in context between class and, and race in your story. Sure, great. Um, yeah, that's a lot of questions. Um, and I don't have a pen. Hopefully I got everything. Um, so I can give you a, a bit more of a sense of sort of what's going on. So the start of this, it is that um, the, the folks that were disenfranchised, so the main Massachusetts, Virginia, sort of those people that's, that were really kicked this off, um, they disenfranchised people based on non compos mentis people who are under guardianship. It actually expanded out and got more vague, deliberately so, um, because the initial concern was that of, as more poor and middling white men were getting enfranchised because of the, the removal of the restrictions, of the economic restrictions, 
what are we going to do here in terms of potential corruption? How do we keep voting important, significant, as folks who did not have reputational sort of value, right? Sort of were part of. Um, and the concern was with respect to guardianship and non compass menace being the requirements is that they didn't encompass enough people because they only hit the two ends of the class spectrum. So people where like their families or others took the trouble to go to the law to get some sort of legal de determination were either from families that had economic resources and wanted to protect them from this person, um, like Britney Spears, right? So, like the or um, people who were so poor that they essentially became wards of the state, right? So it was that um, later the, the conventions of legislators were like, we need something more malleable. It's like, we know that there are all of these other people around that don't actually have a legal status of mental incompetent, but competency, but everyone knows that they are. So we need to get them too, right? So in some ways it is both expansive on class grounds and then also became something that was really flexible. The first focus was against um, essentially white ethnic immigrants, right? Especially with the potato famine, bringing a lot of Irish immigrants to the Northeastern seaboard. Um, doesn't get picked up later until pick it um, to really be used directly as a way to disenfranchise black people. And this is more of a sort of in two grounds. One is that it gets used as a rhetorical justification of this is the reason why we should not full stop enfranchise black people, right? In terms of debates, um, both before and after the Civil War and sort of directly afterwards. It then gets used as a justification of election procedures that get used of, we need to have literacy tests. We need to have sort of all of these other things, right, of discretionary authority because we are worried about people that are not smart enough to be able to independently and intelligently vote, right? So the, that is like sort of where it's lurking underneath, like sort of something that is more race-based and more class-based. When it comes to the political aspects, so yes, absolutely, like it is something that the charge both then and later of not being um, politically traditional um, was voiced in mental terms. Um, indeed, it's actually difficult sometimes when I do research on this and I was sort of Googling things, so much of the rhetoric of it just like put in this metric of craziness, right? Like um, we're so used to sort of throwing those, those terms around. Um, and it is something that's tough to rebut. I mean, part of the point of the book really is to show who are the people that end up being um, the pariahs as everyone else is trying to get in, right? So it just becomes a fight on accuracy, right? It's not us, it's them, but that like the them, my folks, are the people that are properly disenfranchised, whereas it is just slur, slander, inaccurate for whoever is the people that are trying to get in, including, and sometimes, unfortunately, with people who are political dissidents. You have the mic, so yeah, go for it. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, a powerful speech. Uh, it's interesting how both the Irish and uh, Boston featured prominently at least four or five times each. Yeah. And, um, and Boston has a really complicated relationship with race. Mm -hmm. And a, a bit beyond the scope of your book, but maybe it touches. Um, could you speak to that? And if Boston? Yeah, Boston and, race <laughs> and the Irish in, in, a, in a historical lens. Okay, so I think in some ways, as I've been writing it, sometimes I think that a sub um, sort of title of this book could be Everyone Hates the Irish. Um, that disability can be a useful angle sometimes to give us 
sort of illumination on different types of subordination, right? So one of the things that's happening and happening here in this chapter is a way of maintaining a racial hierarchy, right? So disability being used as an indictment of folks that are at the bottom rungs of the white community here, Irish folks, Portuguese folks, right in Rhode Island. Um, and it's not everyone, right? But it is some, it is some folks. And then it is also with uh, folks of color, right? In which it is thought of as more broad. Um, it's also in terms of anti-Catholic bias as well. So one of the reasons, so like there is also a story in which um, the alienist reformers talk about Irish people being also susceptible to insanity and that there should be a waiting period for them to be enfranchised and the reasons why were because of their Catholicism, that they were not used, this is all quotes here, this is not me, all right, so there's quotes of that they're not used to thinking for themselves because the Pope has been thinking for them and unlike Protestants who have to think for themselves. And if they're gonna vote, like again, independent, intelligent American voters, then maybe they should wait a little more in terms of Americanization to, um, before they're enfranchised. So Massachusetts is one of the earliest, right, in terms of implementing literacy tests for voting, for example, right? And that is, to, that is very much targeted towards European immigrants. Um, the other thing in terms of susceptibility to insanity, so one thing here is that before the Civil War, most institutions focused on treating mental disability did not allow black people within them, right? So a lot of this is talking about um, like these statistics in terms of what it's talking about white folks. After the Civil War, in which slavery was over, but then it does become what now, that's when we do see sort of that kickoff of the proliferation of prisons, the movement of black people into these institutions that had previously been racially segregated, but strikingly both their presence and their absence in these places were used as indicators of black inferiority. Um, but Mississippi learned it from Massachusetts, right? Um, disability is something in which often sort of the tools to manage the white population and its internal differentiation are then used to um, be implemented wholesale in other folks. We also see this in sterilization in which the first focus was, bless you, on concerns about white decline, right? So if we think of someone like Carrie Buck, a Buck v. Bell, she is someone who is white. That is not an accident, right? And then the sterilization of some white Americans were then used to, we need to sterilize the women of Puerto Rico. We need to sterilize women on native reservations. We need to sterilize black women, right? So something like the Mississippi appendectomy, which was of black women in the South, like Fannie Lou Hamer being sterilized without even their knowledge, right? Much less their consent, were things that were <laughs> sort of then done, but it was first started on inf inferior sort of white people, quote unquote. All right. Th thank you so much for coming. I have no voice. Oh, and, <laughs> and as soon oh there as, you are. Okay. Right. And I have no voice. And when I'm done with my question, I'm actually heading off to a doctor about my voice, so it won't be a commentary on the answer. <laughs> and, and the question was actually going to be about sterilization, exactly the topic that you went into, um, and the linkages, if any, between what you're focusing on in the 19th century and then the early 20th century push towards sterilization, particularly the procedures used to try to assess competence, acuity, whatever. Are those connected or are those just two separate worlds 
uh, that were that were parallel to each other. I absolutely do think that they're connected. Part of the reason why I wanted to be a disability hist historian who focused before the height of the eugenics era is, well, besides the fact that um, when it comes to disability history in the US, what gets focused in on is the eugenics era, the lead on to the ADA, uh, famous individuals like Helen Keller, and that's about it at this point. But I did not think that a government could come up with a system of classifying and sterilizing people um, based on mental disability overnight. Um, there has to be something that happened beforehand. And there's a long, long story, long deep story of tracking and classifying people um, with implications before we started sterilizing people. And the sterilizing part is really the pessimism and failure of the optimism from before. So if we go to something like uh, this, right? So with Pinnell, this is optimism. This is this thought that if we put people in institutions, we could cure them and then they could be sane and be released. Sterilization happens when there's a sense of great. Okay, so this is not working. People are not getting better. We can't just keep on increasing institutions sort of building onto them. We sterilize people, then at least it's not going to continue in the future. And if you look at the language of Oliver Wendell Holmes and writing Buck v. Bell, a lot of it is that of, um, we have folks in institutions, steril I mean, sterilize them, then they can be let out, they wanna have children, then we can put more people in the institution, do the same thing, and on and on. Hello, I, I too thank you for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, the, uh, the slide of the Harper's Weekly 1876 cartoon showed Here we are. Um, the thing I noticed about that, and maybe it's just my takeaway, but that the two uh, ignorant voters uh, exactly cancel each other out. They're precisely balanced with each other. And I'm wondering if one of the messages of that was if there are Republicans voting on one side, Democrats voting on the other side, that, that sort of, um, it's a wash or something like that, but that may not be what uh, I'm supposed to take from this. Um, but it, it, it does bring to mind the, the issue of immigration. I know that um, by late 19th century, they were, uh, there were medical, uh, medical screenings of, of, of immigrants to find, find uh, people who should not be admitted to the country because of, of um, uh, physical diseases. I, I wonder when, if you know uh, about, about uh, mental disability, obvious mental incapacities, uh, at the immigration border and how that affected uh, people coming in from various parts of the world, mostly from Europe during most of the period that you'd be interested in, uh, but uh, some others sometimes elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the first part of do they cancel each other out? So as folks like your colleague has illustrated, there's a lot of voting for a lot of different things, right? And um, it is of, that everyone should be concerned because everyone has this problem. It just appears in different guises. And there is a concern about who is gonna run cities, who is gonna run states, much less who is going to be the president, right? Um, and a lot of what I look at in the book is a lot of low level voting um, in terms of who's gonna be the sheriff, who's gonna be the coroner, um, like a lot of that is happening and just even a few votes one way versus the other could really change the outcome of play. So we saw that Bush v. Gore, which really was the kickoff of the modern era of election law and that realization, it's been happening for a long time. Um, it's not just the president. In terms of immigration and disability, um, so there's different things that happens. One thing that does happen when um, 
with the potato van, uh, sorry, potato van, like potato famine, um, and Irish immigration was the use of ship bounties in which the ship captains had to confirm that there were not disabled people on the ships. Otherwise, they would be fined and people would be sent back. So, um, as we hit a taco, Hirota, who's at Berkeley Law School, has done, or Berkeley History Department, has done a really good job of talking about Irish um, sort of discrimination and that early history of surveillance. Um, there was also stuff happening in different localities in terms of people not wanting to be responsible. So folks were being pushed from town to town uh, for places, not wanting to have to have the cost of them. Later, with the Chinese Exclusion Act, 1882, one of the things that was part of it was that you could be excluded if you were likely to be a public charge. So that had a very strong valence of surveillance with respect to disability. So that was part of that screening. And then we know later, both in terms of Angel Island and Ellis Island, that um, there was a lot of screening, both for communicable diseases, but then also these concerns over Again, sort of the problem of descent, right, the concern there. So Douglas Baton has written a good book on disability and immigration that looks at a lot of this, which ended up being that families themselves would sometimes make really heartbreaking decisions of who they left behind because of concerns of what, whether the whole family would be knocked out based on um, inspection at the borders. So thanks, I loved your talk as well. Um, and I just wanted to uh, ask you, I know that you're writing the book about the US. Uh, um, you mentioned a little bit about uh, what's happening outside of the US. I know a lot of scientific racism was exported uh, and had a lot of influence around the world. I'm wondering how these dynamics played out uh, you know, in Latin America or other places, Europe, um, whether you have happened to find that information as you did research about the US, I know that's like your book. Uh, but I'd just be very curious whether it had different uh, dynamics uh, elsewhere. I'm sure it did. Okay. So, <laughs> so when it comes to the stuff that I look at, a lot of it is the U.S. looking at Europe, Western Europe especially, of developments that they had made. So they were earlier than us in a lot of ways, like in terms of the asylums kicked off in Europe first with Pinel, with uh, French developments. And then there was also an English um, network with the Tukes, so with, through the Quakers um, into Philadelphia, right? Sort of they were ones that did a lot here. And it was of a modernizing effort that we will be like Europe by having these beautiful buildings, Boston, um, <laughs> and a lot of those buildings were used to put people in, right? But it was also a testament to the benevolence of these modern areas that both, they had enough money, right, to build the buildings in the first place. They were thought of as a stable place to build a building, but also that they cared enough to put people in them. Um, there is some stuff in terms of that it gets pollinated out um, of the United States elsewhere. So into the Pacific world, following missionaries, um, things like that. That said though, the United States is a big place. And one of the things has been really tough, so don't you also probably share my nightmares here, of that um, if I was doing a legal history, Supreme Court, or cases like that, go to the National Archives, park there, just do that. But because this is a national story in a lot of states, <laughs> in a lot of localities, a lot of these ordinary people, I have been more in terms of trying to figure out what's been going on in say Colorado than I have been in terms of Latin America. That said though, it would, I would love it if more people were do, was doing this work also. Hi, thank you very much for that really uh, fascinating lecture and I look forward to the book. I was, um, I had two d really distinct questions. One of them had to do with sort of untangling the different strands of this because like I could imagine a, a, a country in good faith 
uh, enforcing an immigration law, wanting to exclude people that they think are likely to become a public charge without any sort of political or racial bias, you know, sort of baked into it, whether it's going to be administered fairly is another question. But then there are certain aspects of this which seem to be highly motivated by things like race or ethnic discrimination and that sort of thing. And I'm just you know, sort of, if you can imagine all of the different um, aspects of that. Um, have you been able to untangle like motivations in any sort of way that you think will help describe the landscape in this? That's, you know, the, the sort of motivations that we might think are more benign than, than some of the more um, negative ones. The other th question I had was really separate, which is, did you, have you looked at Louisiana at all in this? Because, you know, I've done a little work on hi legal history in Louisiana, and they're so different there that I'm just wondering if maybe there's a big difference there, too, in this. So the first one is, um, I'm so tempted to be a law professor and ask, what do you think would be a non-prejudicial way of administering a likely to be a public charge procedure? So one of the things in terms of all of this, which I think was part of was sort of lurking a bit in the speech here, is trying to think through what is America's future going to be or where will the investments happen. So one of the things the black activists were saying was that you should invest in us. It will be worth it. And what against rebuttal of we shouldn't, it won't matter, you'll be the same in the future. So <laughs> I guess part of the pushback in terms of the likely to be a public charge is implicit in that is a pessimism that when people would come to the United States, they would be exactly like they are at the time, or sort of project out a pessimistic future of people being poor. Right? Um, and people not being able to flourish without taking the responsibility of the United States upon themselves to make a different story, right? So part of the book is to think about these challenges over people's potential, but then also whether people would be part of um, the polity to be able to shape that future. And when it comes, I wrote sort of wrote another piece that was about uh, mass institutionalization and civil death, um, that all there were so many resources that were being devoted to the buildings, the people who were being put within them, but those folks were not dictating any of those resources or any of the money um, or the choice to be put in the institutions themselves, right? They were not being thought of as citizens. They were being thought of as wards for other people to direct their care. Um, so I think this idea of like democracy was like both in terms of the snapshot of what does this look like now and why, but then also what is possible in the future and who will be the people that will have the voices to be able to affect that. In terms of Louisiana, um, yes, there is part of it. And Louisiana has such a fascinating story, both in terms of the different empires that have been a part of it um, with this French and Spanish legacy and having a civil system, but then also such a place of black activism as well. Um, this was one of the places in terms of the reconstruction and then sort of coming out of reconstruction where there was a lot of dueling accounts of black um, voting and violence at the polls by white supremacists and what that meant. So with the hearings that happened in there, thousands and thousands of pages, of, sorry, flashbacks there, <laughs> so, of hearings about the violence that happened as black people voted, and a big part of that is with Louisiana. So one story is black people being, we tried to vote and then we were hurt, right, by people that were trying to thwart us. The other story was 
we came to the polls. We saw all of these ignorant black people, or ignorant Negroes, right, messing up the vote, and we had to protect ourselves and protect the vote against them by shooting them various other things, right? So the violence being defensive for democracy. Um, so this was a big place, like Louisiana, Memphis, various other places being a big part of that. Thank you.